welcome to the Fighting on Film podcast, the podcast all about classic and obscure war movies, from the Normandy landings to the days of chivalry and swords. If it's been captured on film, we're going to try and cover it. I'm Robbie of our own military history. I'm Matthew Moss of Historical Firearms and the Armourer's Bench. Hello, hello. Welcome back to Fighting on Film again. And this week is the Patreon pick. Now, if you're not a member of the Patreon, you, you might not be aware. Um, but if you follow us on Twitter, you, you might have seen the tweet. So every month we ask our fabulous patrons, the Fighting on Film supporting cast, to pick a film for us. Um, and we have a choice of four. Uh, this week we had Hornblower, 55 Days at Peking, uh, Memphis Bell and uh, Red Beret with Alan Ladd. And the fabulous patrons voted for 1990s Memphis Bell. So this is their pick. I was surprised, but I can roll with it. I was hoping for Hornblower, I'll be honest. But um, Matt was crushed. My <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I'm excited to do this one. I am too. Um, it, I, mean, I haven't seen it in a while, but it was really nice to see all the reaction on the Twitter. I mean, that, that tweet blew up on Sunday. I was literally cooking an omelette. I mean, this is you're, you're into the, the looking glass here, people, but I was cooking an omelette and I just tweeted that out. Memphis Bell this week, guys. And my phone didn't stop buzzing all night. It was, it was like, oh my gosh, you know. When did you first see the film, Matt? Oh, that's a good question. We always ask guests, but we never ask ourselves. Um, God, I'm, I think I must have been about 10. Mm. So so we're looking at like 2000-ish. I, I remember watching it as a kid, definitely. I remember it being on TV like late evening. Yeah. ITV and probably? Probably, yeah. It's always ITV, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, I, I remember it being on, and I, I I enjoyed it. Um, but I can't say it's one I've ever like sought out to rewatch. Like I've seen bits right. of it over the years, you know, it's been repeated yeah. on TV. Um, I enjoyed it, but I, it, yeah, as I said, like it's never been one I've gone. I want to sit down and watch Memphis mm. Bell. So when I sat down to rewatch it for the pod, I, I was quite surprised by how much I enjoyed it because obviously it's, I haven't seen it, and oh, it must be at least five, ten years maybe mm. at this point. Um. Never seems to be on. No, it doesn't. Uh, like a lot, a lot gets repeated, but this one never seems to over here. But when did you see it? I think it was at a friend's house. Um, because he was um, my friend's dad was like mad into like planes and stuff. Because where where I used to live in Biggin Hill, underneath the flying path, he was like, "Oh, we should watch Memphis Bell." And I think I watched it then. But as you said, like I'd never really re seen it because I hadn't seen it repeated. And I'm a big Matthew Modin fan, and it's just something that slip through my fingers like I didn't yeah if you're listening Matthew do come on the pod oh yeah please, um. <laughs> please Matthew please Mr Modine please come on we'd love to talk to you about Stanley Kubrick and Birdie and all these great films you've been in actually speaking of Modine we should go through the cast definitely so it's, it's a bit of an ensemble piece this one isn't it massive yeah well, it has to be the, the nature of the beast it's a yeah. crew film isn't it so we've got Matthew Modine as yeah. Captain Dennis Dearborn he's the uh, aircraft commander pilot yeah, interestingly um, enough, actually, his uncle, um, Wilder Modine, flew B-17. So it's a bit of a family affair wow, for, for okay, Modine. So, yeah, special role in, definitely. Mm. Uh, you've got Tate Donovan as uh, First Lieutenant Sinclair, who's the co-pilot. Uh, D.B. Sweeney as uh, First Lieutenant uh, Lav- uh, Lonethal, who's mm-hmm. the navigator. Uh, Billy Zane as Val Kozolowski, I think that is. Yeah. I think his name but he's, um, Val- he's Val- Valentine. Val. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he's sort of the bombardier. Um, Eric Stoltz as uh, Staff Sergeant Danny um, uh, Daly, who's the radio op. Yep. Um, Reed Diamond, who is uh, Verge. Um, and he's sort of the tail gunner. Sorry, the top gunner. Yep. Uh, the tail gunner is, of course, Harry Connick Jr. I think this is his first role. One of. Yeah. Mm. It- and of course, he sings a song. Sean Astin. Who plays uh, Staff Sergeant Rascal Moore, who is the ball turret gunner? Samwise Gamgee himself. Courtney Gaines, who plays uh, McVeigh, who's another waste gunner. Mm-hmm. And he has sort of like a love hate brotherly relationship with Neil Gwintoli's uh, character, uh, Sergeant Jack Bocky, who's the other waste gunner. Um, and yeah, we mentioned Harry Connick Jr., who is the tail gunner. Mm-hmm. And we have a very little role for John Lithgow. Who yes. is sort of like a press corps? Um, yeah, he plays a lieutenant. Water PR man. That's it, like Bruce Derringer. I assume like he maybe 
maybe was writing for the Stars and Stripes or something like that because he has a press photographer with yeah, him. Yeah, he mentions Life Mag. Yeah, yeah. Um, and stuff. But I think he was going to try and get them into everything. Yeah, perhaps like a liaison officer. It never really says. I don't think it ever really says. Yeah, and and you've he, got he, David Strathairn, uh, or Strathairn as Colonel Craig Harriman. Like squadron commander, isn't he? Yeah, wing commander or whatever. Yeah. And there's some nice roles for for a couple of British actors as well. Um, obviously, it's a movie filmed in the UK, as we'll, we'll go on to, to talk about. So you've got Jane Horrocks as mm-hmm. Faith. She has a very small role, um, about a few minutes of, of screen time, but she's really good in it. Um, she plays Faith. And you've got a really young Stephen McIntosh, um, who fans of Lock, Stock and Barrel will know him as Winston from that. He's been all sorts, yeah. Yeah, really good. But he plays um, the rookie, Stan the Rookie. We'll learn about what happened to him later. But yeah, I mean, it's a great cast, isn't it? The ensemble was really strong. A lot of emerging talent. Yeah, a lot of emerging talent. So Modin is like the, the pin, you know, he's like the cover star. And he he literally is the pilot. So it's, it's quite clever how they do the casting. I yeah, think. Sean Astin's had a couple of quite successful films at that point i think he's only like 19 yeah, he's really when this young. was filmed yeah uh, billy zane's up and coming he's yeah. about 23 when this was made so that's another thing we can you know mention is that they've tried to keep the crew youthful to represent yeah. you know the real average age and that's admirable because the they 17 crew yeah they could have filled it with young looking ish brat pack stars of the early yeah. 90s it doesn't ruin the experience of like getting in with the crew you can believe them as people which is just really nice yeah so yeah, maybe we should go into production now. Released on the 4th of September 1990 over here in the UK and then in October um, in the US, which is really rare. I mean, we usually don't get films first. That doesn't even happen nowadays. Filmed here, filmed at RAF Binbrook, an ex-bomber command base in Lincolnshire. Um, and then Duxford was used for when they flew the B-17s, they'd fly them out of Binbrook and fly them into Duxford um, for shooting. And then internal scenes um, within the B-17s were shot at Pinewood Studios. Um, and the budget's quite big for early 90s. It's um, 23 million and it makes 24 million. So I think it broke even, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was produced by David Putnam. Um, and he had just left Columbia Pictures at the time. He went to be a high up in, in Columbia Pictures. It didn't go too well for him. He felt stifled creatively. He didn't like the process over there. So he came back and he set up um, Enigma Pictures. Uh, sorry, Enigma Productions. Uh, and they started filming like a spate of films, and Memphis Bell happened to be the first film that they filmed. He was a fan of the original William Wyler documentary, which, if you haven't seen, you know, it's a, amazing. Yeah, yeah it's, it's just a fantastic piece of wartime cinema in its own right, wartime documentary making. You know, Wyler goes on to direct Ben Hur and Roman Holiday, and he is mega, mega superstar famous um, director at the time. Um, yeah, and there's a documentary. One of the five, yeah. Documentary Five came back. If you've never seen it, it's on Netflix. It's really worth your time. And Catherine Weiler, his daughter, is producer as well. Yeah, there's loads of, of um, interesting stuff with the uh, the technical side of things. So uh, the cinematographer was David Watkin, uh, who had won an Oscar in '85 for Out of Africa. Yeah, um, wow. He'd worked he'd worked in the '60s on. Um, 68 The Charge of the Light Brigade which is a really interesting movie yeah and um, kind of s- similar sort of source material uh, Catch-22 the 70 version the 1970 mm. version of Catch-22 you worked yeah. on um, nice in terms of yeah in terms of editor uh, edited by Jim Clark who'd worked on Yanks in 79 Killing Fields in 84 yep. and he had this is really interesting this blew me away uh, he had an uncredited assistant sound editor role as uh, on The Cruel Sea. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. If IMDb can be taken as, as gospel okay. on that. But, okay. yeah. Don't give away um, your sources, Matt. Come on. No, nah, well, I know. <laughs> yeah. I scour the internet for these things, Rob. Um, special effects was, was supervised by uh, Richard Conway, who did uh, The Temple of Doom in 84, which is... Wow. Um, Monty Python, Meaning of Life in 89. He did In Love and War, which is an Amber pick in 96. Huge, huge films. Um, and Captain Corelli's Mandolin. Wow. Yeah, in 2001. Well, so we. uh, he was the special effects supervisor. And then we can't talk about this film without talking about the model work. Oh, it's just out- so, outrageous. Yeah. There's loads of great aerial model work. There's loads of great ground model work. I mean, the film opens with an amazing sequence where a B-17 is returning from a mission and it skids along that runway. Yes. Um, belly belly landing and it, it 
sort of just passes right over the camera. And it's such great practical model work. I defy and you to, explain to tell me it. that's not a real B-17 coming in. It's so well done. Yeah. And yeah. then it just explodes. Yeah. And that's, what, yeah, a, what a way to open a movie mm. and have all these guys like cheering and clapping because most of the wings returned from a, from a, from a mission and then that happens. And it's, it's, you're immediately yeah. like brought into the moment of mm. there are lives on the line with even with bombers. I mean, we, we're getting ahead of ourselves, but I watched a little clip I sent Matt it for, for when we were, it's on YouTube, um, of the some of the, the model work that was made. And there was a guy who worked on, on the film and he said there's a sequence where the B-17s are taking off to, to go and bomb Bremen. And yeah. the foreground, or the, the, you know, the foreground is all models. Distance is real B-17s. Yeah, so the way they, they did it with forced perspective and they, they built like a little mock runway up on the runway. To, to, to roll the model down mm. or to, to shoot over the model. In the background, the false perspective has the hangar looking like it's the right size for the model. Yeah. And then in the other direction, they have the actual, they had five working uh, B-17s on the movie. Um, and they had those ahead of the model. Mm. So when they took off, it looked like they were all in, in the correct perspective. It's just so good. And it's, it's like, the things cinematography like, to get that kind of shot yeah. composed is incredible. And things me, like anyway. that only happen, like not now, they don't really happen because it's too easy just to mock up some B-17s on a, you know, like a post-editing software in CGI. It's cheaper, I guess. But, yeah, you know, that attention to detail to make that look so realistic, it, it's just, it it raises the film another bar, and especially because when, you know, we, we dive in the archives, things like that. And the more you learn about these movies, the more you enjoy them. And then mm. when you reflect on them, you go, oh, that's a great film because of this. But no, I actually can appreciate on a technical level because so much love and care is going into making the model work look so well, good. Exactly. And the model the model crew had worked on things like half a dozen Bond films. Yeah. Harry Potter movies. They went on to work on the Harry Potter movies, which are full of model work. Of course, yeah. Um, and Nick Finlayson, who uh, was one of the, the sort of model effects supervisors, uh, he worked on... 1997's The Mummy, Aliens, a couple wow. of Bond movies, Harry Potter movies, the more recent uh, Batman movies, people's credits. It's kind of mind-boggling at times. It is. And we should, I should also mention before we move on, the film was directed by Michael Canson-Jones, who's a Scottish director who did the Jackal remake, um, and Rob Roy. So he's probably best known for those films. I like Rob Roy. That's a good yeah. movie. Mm, decent. Yeah. yeah. But it's, it's nice that it's most, you know, it's a very British heavy production for an American tale. Some sources suggest that the movie was sort of inspired by wanting to make a Bomber Command movie. Yeah, that would have been good. And then the funding obviously came from the US, so it sort of pivoted towards mm. making a film about a US crew. Well, it was the, was the production was distributed by Warner Brothers, so I guess they mm. might have had some influence. Definitely. I suppose it's a good point to jump off and talk a little bit about how the film is sort of influenced by the actual Memphis Bell, but really it's yeah. quite a loose adaptation of the story. Yeah, it is. I think the, there was a video um, of the making of, um, of Memphis Bell, and, and it's not a good upload I, I found, um, but it was enough to sort of pick little bits out of. Um, and Modine was talking about meeting the original pilot of the Memphis Bell and how right. that he didn't like the, the fact that his character's name had been changed. It made him sound too much, too, you know, didn't make him sound manly enough or something like that. Um, so he was saying how it it's not a, 100% accurate retelling of the tale mm. but it uses bits from it and you know obviously it, it uses a lot of dramatic license and it uses a lot of historic license shall we say as well at points yeah i think so well the characters are sort of like composites aren't they they aren't, they aren't mm. based on the real crew no verbatim uh, all the character names are changed yes they are um and obviously the, the memphis bell's real story is a little bit different they their last run was uh bombing a, a, a german sub base in france Mm. rather than a Focker Wolf factory in Bremen. So there's lots of little differences. I think really what they, they probably should have done was have made a film about a fictitious bomber crew that was on their 25th mission. Because the film basically follows the crew of the fictionalised Memphis Bell as yeah. they go on their 25th and final mission of that tour. Mm. And John Lithgow's character comes and he wants to capture that triumphant moment of mm. you know the first crew of the eighth air force com completing their first tour 
I think it's that. Mm. It's, it's using that name recognition, isn't it? It's like brand yeah. recognition now, you know. Yeah. Memphis Bell is, you know, the really well thought of documentary from 44 is still has a lot of weight in the film world, I guess, because Putnam says um, he, he watched the movie at the NFT, National Film Theatre, and he said as a for a documentary piece of film, it feels like a narrative piece. But I, I get what you mean where it could have just been a bit, it could have just been a bomber, couldn't it? I think, yeah, I think it would have benefited a little bit of just for being like a separate fictionalised bomber. Um just so they could have had a little bit more breathing room because they cram a lot of tropes into this that well, they do, yeah. didn't yeah. happen to the actual aircraft itself. Mm. So we can't we can't move on from production without talking about possibly the most climactic part of filming. Yeah. Where one of the five operational B-17s actually was destroyed in a crash. There's there's some really grainy but really interesting actual footage that was filmed by a a, a fireman that was on set. It was on the other end of the runway and he he managed to capture the 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 aircraft just as it sort of veered off towards a tree. So like banks and off, a gravel bank. It? Yeah. Yeah. And what happened was it was a French uh, B-17 that, that was being used in the production and possible engine fire and it lost power. So it veered, but the pilot had compensated. Yep. And he made the decision that even though they were now running on grass he believed that it would be okay to take off from grass rather than the runway. And he attempted to do this, but as he throttled up, it continued to veer and it caught a tree eventually. Right. Um, and it veered off into a field and broke into two, almost mirroring a really shocking part of the film, actually. Yes. Gosh, yeah, I didn't think about that. Now you say it. Yeah. Um, and then it, it caught fire and exploded uh, or it burnt. No one was badly injured or, or killed. Yes. Um. At that, at that time, it would have been 45, 50-year-old airframe aircraft. Yeah, it would have been, yeah. Still a, still a big loss. I think today there's only, I think then there were perhaps 12 flying, a dozen at, flying. At the end of that news clip, it says 13 operational. Mm. And I know for a fact that now, I think there are eight or nine oh, wow, that are okay. still airborne or airworthy. As we say, you find that clip on YouTube. It's mm. It's amazing that everyone got out, really. How was the film received when it came out, Rob? Have you managed to rustle up a contemporary review for us this week? Of course I have. The retro reviews are always fun to find. And uh, this week it comes from the Daily Mirror again. Um, they're just a great resource. And I think we've had uh, one review from um, the, the Daily Mirror's Pauline McClug before. I think we had uh, one of her reviews for Last of the Mohicans. The headline is Flying High, Bell's Heroes Put Putnam Back on Target. On a wing and a prayer, the legendary Memphis Bell, a lumbering bomber, flew death-defying missions over Nazi-occupied Europe, but it's astonishing the giant B-17 fortress even made it into the air. What's even more astonishing in David Putnam's Memphis Bell is the bravery of the American Flyboys. Based on a true story, the movie directed by Michael Canton Jones of Scandal fame follows the Bell's 25th and final bombing raid. If the crew of 10 in their teens could survive this mission, they would return home as heroes. It's noisy, war heroic stuff. A good old fashioned nail biter with not a superstar in sight. I found a, a newspaper clipping later on in the week um, where she gives it three stars, which uh, on her rating at the time was like a great night out. So she really rated oh, it. Oh, cool. Yeah. Okay. So she, she only gave like one to four stars in her ratings. So three mm -hmm. was quite high. So yeah. That is high. Yeah. Mm. So I suppose we should outline the plot briefly. Um, as we've already mentioned, it's about the fictionalized Memphis Bell's final mission yep. uh, on a, uh, a bombing run against a uh, Fokker Wolf 190 factory in Bremen. Mm -hmm. And the film opens with a, a little bit of sort of preparation where it introduces characters, um, lays out the fact that this is their 25th mission and the end of their tour. But there's also a lot of superstition around it where they don't want to like jinx the fact that it's their final mission. Mm -hmm. um, there's, the, there's the scene at the dance where John Lithgow tries to get everyone to give him three cheers. Oh God! And, yeah, and gets gets met by silence. Goes um, down like a lead balloon, doesn't it? It's like yeah. hip hip. Oh shit! <laughs> <It's> like... 
Um, and there's a beat he sort of tries to outfit a Quonset hut with, uh, you know, a welcome back party. Yeah. And the the uh, the wing commander is very much unhappy about this. Mm. And that leads to one of the best best scenes. Yes. I'm sure Robbie's going to talk that. about that it's later. One of my favourites. Yeah. Um, and then the the majority of the film, I guess, after the first 25 minutes, is the guys, you know, airborne, mm. and we get the full mission. So we go from that really nice sort of montage at the beginning where they're checking planes, loading bombs, checking guns, um, as the crew are sort of like driving a jeep to the to the aircraft and they're singing. Um, Amazing Grace, I think it is. It is, yeah. And, not, it's a um, nice um, little call to the original movie. In the original, they all turn up in a jeep, which is really nice. You know, mm-hmm. it's nice little homages all the way through. And then we, we see the, the rest of the mission. So it's them flying to the target, defending themselves against attacking enemy fighters. Yeah. Um, then there's a little bit of a, a problem when they get to the target. The the factory is obscured by what is apparently a smoke screen. So they decide to loop around and go for a second run, which is something they wouldn't really have done. Yeah, we had some... A um, little bit anachronistic. We, yeah, because we had a bit of a discussion on, on Twitter as well with Matt Bone, I think, Dan Ellen. And he, they were saying, you know, it, it's one of the few things that annoys them because it's not representative of like, uh, strategic bombing or precision yeah, they definitely bombing. would have wouldn't have circled Circle that round back for around, another run, yeah. i don't think um and then them fighting for survival to get back isn't it and that's yeah. that's basically the plot that's the plot the spoilers movie. they make it back just like the real memphis bell yeah of course yeah pacing's really good it doesn't outstay it's welcome if you did it wrong it would feel boring because it's just in the b-17 you know it's almost like different sets you've got the cockpit you've got the mid with the waste gunners so you get that bit too you've got the the navigator in his little radio room you've got billy zane in the in the yeah the navigator and the bombardier in the bombardier in the, in the nose below the cockpit and then you've got harry connick jr just singing to himself in yeah. in the rear gunner position oh and sean astin's in the ball turret of in course the ball turret. so they're all they all they feel like separate areas because they are they, you know sean is isolated in his ball turret you know, he says i don't want to go in there come on like oh god not nice you know and you've got to have a lot of balls to go on those things you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know as, as you, you see 24 missions exactly you know and they you know, doesn't want to put a safety clip on but thank god he good does, he does. It saved his life yeah i just i like the way it's done it never feels like an enclosed one set film it does feel so i know that's mm. one of the criticisms that was it Cisco and ebert didn't like the fact that there wasn't enough different shots it was too much in the plane i'm like well, yeah what can i you think do? cisco was, was complaining that the the scene where uh, sean astin uh his ball tour is shot away and he's hanging by his safety clip yeah uh his, his safety harness uh he was saying that they should have shot that from another angle but i don't, I don't see know. how you could have done that effectively i mean yeah i mean you couldn't have done that from ex- externally because it would have wouldn't have looked as tight as i think they thought it might have looked because it would have just been his legs you see sean hanging so you see sorry you see rascal hanging on for dear life and you see the abyss below you, the, yeah. that's as much peril as you that's need. the angle that you should shoot that from you shouldn't shoot yeah. that from above you want the jeopardy of seeing the open sky below him because not only do you get the shock of sean being frightened for his life um the actor sorry you, you get this shock of his friend trying to save him seeing mm. the drop below it's a power. I think it does its emotional beats quite it's well. It's one of the best scenes. And, yeah. you know, we, so they see um, all the bombers in the formation getting attacked mm. and some of, some of the um, crews of the other aircraft are seen falling from, from their stricken planes yeah. without chutes. And Modine says over the, over the intercom, put your chutes on. Yep. And he tells uh, Rascal to, to clip in. Uh, and he is he doesn't want to because it's hurts. uncomfortable yeah exactly and it it has a nice little tight close-up of him putting the little clip on and, and mm. securing himself and you just go oh something's gonna happen get here. it now yeah 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 and it does and Te- it uh, telegraphs later on it does. things a a 109 shoots away the bolter at lucky man survived it didn't get hit yeah um and obviously they have to unclip that to pull him up as well yeah. which is an added layer of jeopardy mm. but yeah I, I really like that scene there's a lot of it's it's a film where sort of if the acting was wrong if the acting wasn't was off it wouldn't work mm. because you, there's a lot of facial acting going on because the oxygen masks are on yeah 
if they were flat actors, it, it definitely wouldn't be as a, a stronger movie. Everyone's selling their emotions through their face, which is hard to do. Because, you know, it used to be an actor. It's really hard to do. If someone takes away your mouth, expressing through your eyes is just hard to do. Well, that's, you know, I suppose, like, even now for everyone, it's, it's weird. Like, when you go into a shop and you're wearing a mask, it mirrors today. Yeah, exactly. You can't, you can't smile at people. You're just smiling yeah. with your eyes, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like raise the eyebrow, hoping it makes yeah, sense. Yeah. And like, it does weird. sell it. And the banter as well between the crew is just really good. And it, these hmm. feel like men that are 24 missions in. Um, you know, that's also one of my criticisms of the movie, because I don't think it does enough to sometimes tell the audience these are men that have done it 24 times. There's a reason Matthew Modin is so cool and calm or doesn't seem like it's bothering him because he's so involved in getting these men there and back again. Yeah. That he's shut off emotionally. Deal with it. Modine, well, Modine doesn't... I, I feel like he doesn't have a lot to do in this movie other than be that stoic aircraft commander. And he does it well. He does it well he enough. He does. He does it well because what he does is he conveys the fact that he's very composed. They all kind of mock him for going through checklists and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, telling them to do things that they know they're going to do because they've done it 24 times before. Of course. And they, you know, they mock him over the intercom. And he, he kind of feels pained in that scene, doesn't he? Mm. Where he's like, oh, I'm not that bad. Yeah, exactly. But you know yeah. why he's doing that? Because the way he portrays it is he's trying to be the stoic commander that reminds everyone of what they need to do because this is their 25th mission. And after this, they get to go home. Exactly. So if they die on this mission, then the book stops with him. He's, he's the commanding officer. That's it. We've done our bit for Uncle Sam. Now we're flying for ourselves. And you get that great payoff at the end where he he um, he, he showers everyone with the, the champagne that Danny has, has stowed away, and it's that release that it's a release for all of them. It to is the release that, of, the, of the queue of the, and of that the crew. Scene is really elating. It does make you feel good because you know mm. the lads are safe. You know you do feel that emotional release there. You know, yeah. and it's written on Modine's face. It's just really nice to see. But they feel like a proper crew, don't they? They do. Let's talk about some fifty cows. Yeah, Ali Tally. It's time for Ali Tally on Fighting on Film. So, yeah, as Matt mentioned, I think you know his pick from this week. Yeah, if I didn't, if I talk about the 50 cows, everyone would be like, why didn't Matt talk about the guns? Sorry, they, they're in a flying fortress. They didn't talk about the fortress part of it. <laughs> <laughs> You have to mention them because there's they're such a key element. They're the only defense of the aircraft. Like a third of the crew are manning them at any one time. And we get some great aerial combat scenes. Really good. Yeah. Um, they are ANM2, the lightened okay. um, 50 caliber. So they're not sort of like the ground ones that you see on tanks, etc. Right. Um, that's why they have that little um, extended cooling shroud because the barrel's lighter because it's air cooled because we're up in like 25,000 feet. They don't need all of that barrel to dissipate the heat. Saving weight as well for the bomber. I really like the portrayal of them because you, you really see them from, from behind the guns as well as from in front. Mm. So the cinematography is really good because it pays off really nicely. You see them clutching the, the, the spade grips of the guns and letting rip. You see the rounds and the tracer going down range towards the fighters that are coming in. Um, but you you also see these nice sort of like quarter shots where they're from the side you get the, the yeah, side yeah. the profile of the gun and you see them leaning back into it or you can see they're really manhandling them yeah Quintoli talks a little bit about this in one of the interviews um, he did and he talks about how he spoke to a, a waste gunner okay um, the the flown in B-17s and he talks about how he, he took on this sort of almost paternal mindset towards the gun. So he'd help the armorer clean and oil the gun sometimes after shooting. Oh, wow. So he, he, he sort of he took on like a bit of a method actor mm. element to, to running the gun itself, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, because he's, um, he's all over the gun. Is he saying like, you know, oh, mm. we got one, baby, come on. You know, yeah, like, his character is very gung-ho. And yeah, I like it. Like very much about the gun. Mm. And... He has that nice rapport with uh, the other waste gunner in that the other waste gunner has got two confirmed kills. He only has one um, and he wants, he wants that, that second kill. Hmm. There's a nice scene where you can see McVeigh, the other waste gunner, 
re- he's, he's got both hands on the charging handle of the of the of the, the fifty cal, and he's wrenching it back, obviously to clear a jam. That's when they're going to um, go and try and save Rascal, aren't they? Exactly. You can and see you can, him really. There's a nice shot down the few the fuselage of the plane, and he's really wrestling with it. And my favorite bit is the tail gun action we get, and the yeah, really the, the the ball turret. That's just yeah. There's some really great stuff in there. I used to play a, a. I don't know if you played it, Matt, but it was a anyone on the any listeners to the pod you might not have played the game. My dad bought me B seventeen Gunner video oh, game. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's like two thousand and three or two. Yeah, and and you were like you could switch to all the gunners, and it like it really just reminded me of playing that game when I was little. Like the nostalgia. Was that, that was hit. on PC, right? Yeah, PC. Yeah, I absolutely adored that game. I don't know whether I bought. I don't know whether I played that, but I definitely remember seeing that in like in the shop yeah, so good Matt so mm. might have to get an emulator for it and give it a go but it's it, it's yeah, really good but those yeah for gaming yeah but those things are so strong and as the only armament of the bomber it, you, you mm. feel it, this is where this is where I wrote down in my notes the bomber becomes its own character yeah they're all mutually supporting each other flying in the formation and and it's nice to hear them all like pointing out targets and talking to going, one another over the internet. yeah exactly and they're you know and they're even saying like you know wait until you know, wait, wait until they're in range, conserve your ammo, things like that. It's the, mm. the chatter is very realistic and you, and because you know that they're in an in enclosed space and they can't move either. Like it's not that the men can run away. You have, there's, they have to stand their ground because they can't not do anything else. Yeah. Every time a, a fighter came in, I was in my seat like, come on, do it. You know, please. You're like, you know, please see it off. I was feeling the anxiousness when the, that's mm. another thing the film really gets. Yeah. Does well is the, anxious feeling of seeing a, a you know an emmy 109 come in you're just like please you know don't shoot them down you, you know really get into caring for the men yeah it draws you in it really does any other rally tally for you i mean that was my that was my main one um i also liked you know seeing uh, the uniforms because that that they look that great. 40s yeah. u.s army air force look is one of the strongest crush hat yeah tie leather flying jacket mm-hmm. painted on insignia oh, it just looks great but yeah i mean the main one obviously had to be mentioned was the was the 50 cals of course you know it wouldn't be any telling without at least one weapon i mean the me the mise en scene of this movie is really strong and i know that yes. some of your picks play into that thank you for segueing into my choices this week really nice That's what i'm here for um, <laughs> oh yeah so for me i mean as always you know jeep hats I like them. They're they're pretty cool. You know, woolen the woolen hat, mm. peaked cap. I like seeing them. And you know, they've all got them upturned. Yeah. The, the the peaks turned up. You know, that's like a, a fashion. I think with air crews in the days, a lot of contemporary photos of guys like that. And yeah, and the good the good luck charms, things like that. You know, men hold. You know, um, McVeigh with his medal and tail gun has got something on his. Is it a horseshoe or something? Yeah, like and uh, yeah. Danny has a look elastic band. That's it, yeah, and he, you know, and everyone's got their own little things. Mm. But it, for me, it was um, one of the one of the um, one of the, the the scenes in in one of the barrack huts. The beginning has them going through a Sergeant Becker's kit locker um, yes. because he's been killed on a mission, and they pull out his you know his folly clover. And it was in his dirty book, wasn't mm-hmm. it? Yeah. yeah, and it was like the attention to detail as well with the the lucky strikes and everyone smoking, you know, all the time, and they're Baseball even smoking cards. when they're going up. Baseball cards, things like this. It's, it's that homely thing. I, I like that. But what, one thing that stood out was Danny Boy. He's in his little part of the plane. And there is a US Airman's lunchbox on his navigator table with his cigarettes and his camera. And I really like seeing that. I so, love this camera. That was that was what I forgot to mention is my other early pick. That was cool. It's a nice, nice yeah, it's good to see. It's personable, isn't mm. it? It's a personable thing. Yeah, I just I like seeing that little inclusion on his table, and it, what it is, it's so I won't bore people to death with it, but I quite like learning about army rations. I think it's just yeah. an interesting little piece of history there. And this was a a little um, like a little snack box, really. It's not it's not really lunch, um, but they th- they had a uh, fudge in there, licorice chops, um, pan coated peanuts, fudge and gums. So everyone's chewing gum in the movie. Yeah. If you ever had like a um, a box of poppets mm-hmm. where there's a little like hole and you get one out at a time you could manipulate the box to let one out at a time so with the big flying gloves you've got and you don't have to fiddle mm. you can just press a little bit of a box and it comes out um but it is a little an- anachronistic because the air crew lunch came out in september 44 right so this movie's set in 43 so it's a little bit anachronistic but it's just nice to see it 
Yeah, and another another little bit of set dress that I noticed was anachronistic was um, there's like a, a bomb site manual that has October 44 written on it. That's just one of those things that have slipped through, yeah. obviously. But again, but that's it, the thing about a HD re-release. Yeah, like yeah. you notice that more. But again, it plays into that what I was saying earlier that perhaps this would have you know been better suited as a fictionalized uh, air crew and aircraft without having to to date it to 1943 and link it to Members Bell. Well, we'll see what Masters of the Sky does when it comes I mean, out. Yeah, I mean, this got this really you know got me excited for Masters of the Sky. It makes me want to go back and watch Catch Twenty Two too because I like that series. I know I need to watch the new one. I haven't seen the new one mm. yet. I liked it. I thought it was good. But yeah, you know, obviously Ali picks for me as always. You know, Dodge ambulances, Willis jeeps, no beddies. Um, no beddies, but you know, he could have had them. They're on an RF base. They could have. But anyway, doesn't matter. Jane Horrocks could have arrived in a in a beddy. <laughs> that would have been good, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> And then P-51s, because who doesn't like P-51s? I mean, they're anachronistic too, but I'm not an aircraft guy. I read it and I, I was like, ah, so... That, mm. that in the original Memphis Bell Death Thunderbolts. But... Yeah. Hey-ho. Matthew, favourite scene? Well, Robert, I think my favourite scene is... Fucking <laughs> <laughs> Robert, in my mother. Jesus Christ. <laughs> said Matthew. Do you want to do that again? No, keep, oh, in. What? keep going. All right, my favourite scene, I think, has to be... Um, okay, let's set this up. So all throughout the film, the co-pilot, Luke Sinclair, played by Tate Donovan, is badgering Harry Connick Jr.'s character, um, so, uh, Sergeant Busby, who's the tail gunner for a chance to fire his gun in action. Complaining about it before they go up. Yeah, he just wants to, like arguing. you know, I, how can I go back to the States without getting a, a, you know, a kill? I'm like, well, you're yeah. a pilot. Like, <laughs> you've co-piloted you've a B-17 some kills. You're, you're, a, yeah. you're a B-17 <laughs> bomber oh, pilot. Yeah. You've gotten some kills. Um, Whether you meant to or not, you have, unfortunately, yeah. So he's, he badges him all the way through and, and Harry Connick Jr.'s uh, character uh, you know, finally relents and says, okay, you can... You can have a go, and mm. you know the. I think it's on the second run to the to the target, and he goes back there and, and mans the gun, and he does. He gets his kill. He shoots down a one hundred nine. Sadly, that one hundred nine, as it veers off into a, into a spiral, it cuts right through the tail of a neighbouring B seventeen, uh, mother and country. It's a, a plane yeah. full of rookies there stand the it's their first mission yeah. um and it cuts straight through completely decapitates the tail gunner position from the rest of the aircraft and it has to be one of the most harrowing scenes in the film it's definitely not a fave fave it's no. a harrowing sort of selection yeah. for this one because mm. it's hard to ignore it's so well done the stricken b-17 arcs over descends down into cloud and danny who has been talking to the rookie sergeant played by mcintosh they've been talking back and forth over the intercom they're not supposed to but they they've been they've been talking over the radio it's giving him little tips and pointers isn't he about what to do you know what what should i keep in my logbook should i write everything yeah. down that sort of thing and they pick up their radio and you can hear them screaming and, and you know calling for help and it fades and out it fades yeah. out into this super harrowing um, mm. radio static which sounds like screams and even the framing of that shot is really well done yeah. so that harkens back to Memphis Bell where while at 44 sorry Memphis Bell while is filming through windows mm. and in the shot you can just see the the outline of a window oh, the frame yeah um, the frame of the window yeah and you see the plane tumble fall through the sky and it's so powerful because that's 10 men you know, yeah, into oblivion. It's just into oblivion. It's just so, it's striking. And you and I think you, I felt that every time a bomber went down in the movie. Yeah. Well, that scene where someone gets, you know, thrown from the 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 bombardier compartment, and they go, "God, he hasn't got a shoot on." And they cut so quickly as well, so you don't see too much. Yeah. And your your mind fills in the blanks. It's a really really well shot sequences, and it's tastefully done as well. And it shows you the 
But I, I, the absolutely mad conditions of fighting the air war as well. Exactly. The the thing about that scene for me is that it it's contrasting with that gung ho desire to get a kill. Yeah. And then he's immediately met by the repercussions of doing that. So Harry Connick Jr. could have shot down that plane and the exact same thing could have happened. Thing could have happened. Well, it's yeah. all the more powerful for him having swapped out Donovan's character wanting what it's it's one of the tropes. One of the tropes is that he feels like he isn't doing anything as the co-pilot, which isn't true. That's it. Yeah. Seventeen yeah. Because he says, doesn't he, before, lots before to he goes do. to before he goes to help him, I'm the only one not doing yeah. anything. And he complains to Lithgow at the dance, like I'm not doing anything. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. And he feels like he, like manning that gun would be doing something. And now that he's done something, he's inadvertently cost ten men their lives, thirty men their exactly. lives. Yeah, and it's just, and and that you can see it all in his face. The minute the, mm. gotta live, you know, the that, gotta the, live with that for the rest of his life. Yeah, it's it through his eyes. Mm. You could just see the sort of raw emotion that he's done. It, he hasn't done it. He didn't mean for it to happen. But that's what. Like, yeah, yeah. There's, there's consequences to things that you could never plan. You could never know that that would happen. And it's also the way that the crew react. They go, I think Austin in the bull terry goes, oh, they, you know, they got, they went right through. It's almost monotone. And you think, well, these guys have seen that mm. for 24 missions. You know, it must wear thin and then it must sort of, you must have to try and push it back mentally to keep going. Yeah. I mean, before we hit it's record, we were sequence. talking about yeah, that that famous footage of the, the B-17s folding on themselves when they were on fire. And, you know, mm. that that stays with you. I think it's it's easy to see documentaries and things and just think of the machine mm. it, and it you know it's especially with the air war forget about the people yeah you know these are these are ten men and and I think this segues into my I'd say favorite scene it's not favorite scene it's just more powerful scene and well shot well done scene in the movie is Lithgow is trying as Matt mentioned earlier Lithgow's character is trying to set up this welcome home party for the crew of Memphis Bell yeah. when they come back. Colonel Harriman, he comes in and he's like, what are you doing? You know, getting quite irate about it. And Lithgow's giving him some short strift, like, oh, you're cracking up. You're going crazy. You know, you just care about getting men in the air. <laughs> and you think, okay, Lithgow, you've been a bit of a dick, mate. You know, come on. You know, you're obviously not as, you're obviously a bit of a desk jockey, I think. Yeah, he doesn't know the realities of war, does he? Mm. Harriman stands up, passes him a letter and says, this is the letter of a boy who just got his head blown off on a mission. You have a voiceover of Lithgow reading out the letter. And then he stops and his tone changes, his face drops, his shoulders drop. And then the scene fades into stock footage of um, gun cam footage of B-17s getting fired upon. And it's voiceover of fathers, mothers reading these letters. And it's just so, it's so hard hitting emotionally. I wasn't expecting it. And I must admit it did. It got to me. You know, Lithgow's not, great in that scene. He's so good. And it's the, it's the weight of the... It's using the emotional... Um, and it, So it's using the powers and strengths of your veteran actors at this point to do the emotional weight more in that sequence. And it's just... It's use of stock footage in that sequence. Is, uh, we, last week on Objective Burn, when James Holland, I chose a stock footage sequence for my favourite scene. It's the same this week because... The emotional weight of that footage is just, it's so well done in the fact of it reminds you the war was real. Yeah. And it doesn't matter how old you are, how well versed you are in the Second World War and the air war. Black and white documentary footage, you know it's real. Mm -hmm. And it's also, I think I said on Twitter to one of my followers, I thought it might have been Jack Bowsher, but I said, you know, it's it's a movie as well. Using stock footage in a way to enhance a movie not using it to replace things they can't shoot themselves. Mm. And I think that's really well done too. But it, it it's, for me, one of the most powerful scenes in the film. And I might add as well that the aerial combat sequences are done really well and they still hold up to that. They are, um, yeah. There's, there's a few bits where it looks a little bit perhaps janky or dated, but really, I mean, it's a film made in 1989, 90. You get the, it's that blue screen grain, isn't it? Yeah. It is. The, the practical effects are cutting edge they're as good as they get mm. um 
and they stand up well. You you know exactly yeah. what is going on. You get a, so you I get got... a feel for those fighters weaving in and out of the uh, the formation. Mm. You get the so... you get the shock and awe of those aircraft disintegrating and crashing. It's mm. it's still effective. And some some of the turret bits when they're zooming into a turret firing, it reminded me of the the Death Star run where the turrets are firing at the X Wings. Oh yeah, or Luke Luke on the the Falcon. Yeah. Yeah, it just reminded me of it a little bit. Yeah, I I I do love the cinematography in this film. Um, so it's really well done. It is. I... Oh, and I mentioned stock footage, and I I do want to mention it before we move on. Um, sorry, but there's a really nice little bit where um, Billy Zane drops the bombs, mm-hmm. and you see all the bombers around them are dropping their bombs now, and it cuts to a little bit of stock footage of bombs dropping and hitting a target. Now that's colorized footage, or that's footage. Um, from the original Memphis Bell film yeah. of the the actual Memphis Bell dropping its bombs over the target. And it's only like a five second, 10 second clip into cut um, with the real footage, but it's a really nice little homage to the original, the film. Um, and it's a blink and you'll miss it bit, but I just wanted to make people yeah, aware if yeah, they weren't no, aware. I, I, did, I missed it until you, you mentioned it. I was like, oh, wow. I watched I them back to, to back. back look for it. I watched Memphis Bell yeah. and right after I watched the original. It's just a great little homage. It's really well. It's it's nice to see a film appreciating the movie that it's based on, to remember those brave lads, because you know, they were. I guess that wraps fave scenes. I mean, we've picked a couple mm. of really interesting ones there. They're not favourite scenes in the classic sense of that's no. that's a part of the film that I love. It's a it's a part of the film that we've appreciated for what they've attempted to do. I think I think there's parts of the film that got us emotionally the most, mm. weren't they? Yeah. Because I mean, we could have easily picked, you know, say, that montage sequence of them starting up the aircraft, or you know, some of the great aerial stuff. But I think those two scenes are really impactful. They are. That's the word. And I guess that brings us round to some final thoughts. Yeah. So, you know, I think for a film that was made thirty years ago now, thirty-one years ago now, I mean, it really holds up. You know, Modine is inherently watchable. I, you know, absolutely love Modine. It's just. He's one of those actors, you know, he just mesmerizes me with his performances. I just I just really like him. And and the cast are really believable as a crew. You buy them as a crew. Definitely. Yeah. When they land, you feel good, you feel great for them, you feel elated, you know. No, no one died, they all made it back. It was it's really good. But there's a caveat where I think sometimes the movie is just using a little bit too much suspense tropes. A little bit too much. Will they? Won't they? Well, I was talking to I was talking to Dr. Dan Ellen from uh, the International Bomber Command Center. He heads up their digital archive and exhibition. Mm. And he was he was actually an extra in the movie. He when we tweeted about, it, he replied and said that um, he was actually an extra in the uh, the the dance hall scene and also in the briefing scene. So that was that was really cool. And he was saying that um, he does think that it it sort of shoehorns in almost every trope and, and cliche to and it's in order to build that tension you know for the air crew um but it but he says it ends up doing a reasonable job of of portraying the tension that was you know on those operations and another really interesting thing that he mentioned was something that i thought of as well the the film sort of props up that trope of really accurate bombing yes um the the film the film describes it as uh pickle barrel bombing i believe yeah, um, right in the pickle barrel. And that's yeah. one of the, the parts of the movie that sort of jars for me. We see we see the bombs fall, we see a few explosions on the ground. Um, but we don't see any of the effect of the bomb. We know mm. that they're bombing a uh, an aircraft factory in Bremen, and we know that there's a school nearby because they mention it in the briefing, and then Modine again mentions it when he decides to go around on a um a second run because he doesn't want to drop his bombs on the nearby school um, because they're the lead aircraft. And once they drop their bombs, the rest of the, the formation will drop their bombs. But the, the problem for me in that scene and the film in general, I suppose, does rely a little heavily on tropes. And it tries to cram in as many of the sort of things that you know occurred to bomber crews. And that's one of the things that props up in some of the that's one of the things that pops up in some of the interviews where they talk about they might not have all happened to the Memphis Bell crew, but they happened to air crew. So there's a bit at the end of the movie where yeah. um, one of the guys is 
dangling out of the uh, the Bombay. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, yeah which yeah. which is it's that is already a really suspenseful scene because they're trying to like yeah, because they're trying to get the landing gear down exactly. Yeah, I'm like, we don't need any more suspense. Yeah. Like, God, I'm already gripped. Come on, film. Like, don't tease me anymore. But I th- you know, I think, I think that's what I got annoyed yeah, at a little bit. I think. And and Dan mentioned this as well. The film sort of sidesteps and avoids that moral aspect of bombing. So mm, yeah, Matt Bone was saying that too to me. It's yeah. entirely about the, the aircraft and its crew, and the the tension and the losses that the air crews are taking. Um, we don't see any of the impact on the ground. Um, we only we only see Bremen through a, a bomb site, and we don't. Yeah, we do. Yeah, and the fact that Modine mentions that school and not wanting to bomb the school kind of makes me think, well, you've sidestepped the moral issue here because we know that the rest of that bomb wing is just going to drop their bombs and it is carpet bombing. Yeah, they're flying, They're not flying a nice little line all dropping their bombs after another. Yeah. It's a liberty. The film's taking a liberty there to it avoid is, yeah. the moral aspect of, yeah. of bombing. But, but- it, yeah, but in that sequence, you can see them all. They fanned out and they're bombing in a, in a wide area. You know, you don't have to be a bombing expert to realise that not all those bombs are going to be dropping on that mm. little factory there. You know, it's precision bombing and precision bombing are two different things, you know, especially by Second World War standards. You know, it's... Yeah, but that, that's one of my main criticisms of the film. Obviously, the, the tropes are forgivable when you consider it in the fictionalised sense that it's not telling the specific story of the Memphis bell. But yeah, the liberty it takes there is a little bit jarring, especially now, you know, we're 30 years on and that much more has been written about carpet bombing and the aerial bombing. Um, of course. But yeah, I think all in all, it, it the movie stands up. I enjoyed it quite a bit more than I expected to, because obviously I haven't seen it in quite a while. And I think it's got a strong cast and they all do a really good job of, you know, creating that feel of a of a veteran crew and the aerial scenes are very effective and those you know that's those scenes that we picked for for our favorites really impactful really powerful exactly and i i think that's the thing that i sort of want to end on is really like for its flaws and it doesn't have many you know it, it the flaws that it have are historical flaws and you know you can go away and learn more about that as a viewer Definitely made me want to go back and watch the original, which I would highly recommend. And that's available via the Library of Congress. So it's freely available to watch. Yeah. And, you know, we were lucky enough to see um, Memphis Bell in in its, like, restored state. It's um, high-res, high-definition restored state. And it really holds up. There's not... I don't think think there's any parts of it where I was like, wow, it's not aged very well. You know, you've just got to apply the usual caveats of its practical model effects. In it's 1990 and they're quite well done um yeah, they are yeah i'm excited to see um masters of the sky some of the the you know the the things john orloff's been saying and it on his twitter account you know i mean like wait until you see a bomber stream the way we're doing yeah. it you know it's gonna be I'm, I'm excited to see that and i it renews my longing to see a bomber command movie Pre- you know adaptation of um of Bomber by Len Dane would be great, for instance. Yes, please. Yes, please. And Warriors for the Working Day while you're at it. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, yeah. So, brilliant. So, um, that was Memphis Bell, and we hope we did it justice, guys. Thank you for choosing it on the Patreon poll. And if you aren't a patron yet, please do check out the Patreon. We have some wonderful perks, and uh, we have some more coming up as well. We do, and we are getting some brand new merchandise coming through. So we have been hard at work on that. We have been very much. So when that comes, we'll uh, I think we'll let the Patreons have their little first look at that when it comes up. So if you're a Patreon user, keep your eyes peeled and for those. And yeah, thanks very much again for listening, everybody. So as always, like, share, subscribe to the pod, whatever you're listening on, leave us a review, have a look at the Twitter, check out the website www.fightingonfilm.com there you go (laughs) and we'll catch you again next week when I think we will be talking Testament of Youth with the fantastic Olivia Smith from the Kaki Malarkey podcast we will indeed thanks for listening guys thank you very much everyone bye bye bye